Welcome. If you want to learn how to make beautiful ceramic plates like this, then this video is right for you. I have made several videos about making plates in the past, but this video is sort of like a new edit where I take you through all the different steps. The tools, the clay, the firing, the glazing, until the final plates and evaluating the results. So uh, let's get on with it. I always throw my plates on bats. This is a, a wooden bat and there's a hole in it. So it attaches itself over the pins that I have on my wheel. That's an easy way to use uh, bats. I use the bats because, especially with a plate where you have a very wide surface, it's almost impossible to remove it when it's still wet without distorting it. Having it on a bat, you can just remove the whole bat and let it dry, and that makes it much more easier to deal with. If you don't have a wheel with uh, pins, then of course you can't use bats with pinholes, but you can still use bats. Instead, you can put a layer of clay on your, on your wheel head and then glue the bat onto that. It's a little more tricky, but a lot of potters are using that. Um, so in any case, I will suggest to use bats. In addition to the bat that I'm throwing on, I'm using, what is it, four, five tools. Some of them are homemade and some of them are industrial. I use my preferred sponge, uh, the mud tool sponge, and I have this little rip that I use. It's um, specially made because the splash pan is so close to, um, to the wheel head that a normal rip wouldn't fit. And also I wanted a specific um, angle here, so I made this one. This is my favorite roller. It's from a used company called um, MK, MKM Tools, and they uh, have lots of different designs. This is one of my favorite, uh, sort of a Celtic design. And then this tube, it's not particularly homemade, but a home cut, <laughs> very useful in the way I make plates. My latest invention is this tool. It doesn't look so good, but it's very helpful. I put it over the edge of the splash pan, and then I have this nail that I put in to cut the size of the, of the plate. That way they become exactly the same size every time and it's just so much faster than having to measure it. I love that. You can use any kind of clay you want to make plates. I've been making plates in porcelain and in stoneware. In my own workshop, I primarily work in stoneware and I like how it looks. Unlike bigger pieces uh, where you do need, or at least it's easier when you have some grog in the clay, you don't actually need to have grog in the clay for plates because it's not that big. And if you want a very smooth surface, maybe you want to pick some clay without that. And then it's a question of the color. With the porcelain, of course, you get that super white surface that's really nice in itself, which is the clear glaze. And some glazes look really beautiful on porcelain. But with a storeware, you can get all kinds of colors. In my initial testing of the designs I wanted to make for my plates, I tried out three different uh, storeware that I use a lot. A gray one, and a red one, high iron uh, storeware, and a black one. And then I tested uh, lots of different glazes on these uh, plates. And what I found out is that the black clay actually comes out the best. The one that I'm using is called 371, and it's from a German company, Jorsen Schneider, and I really, really like that. It does have some grog, but I can still make it super, super smooth. The great thing about the black clay is not only does it look good, but also it doesn't really matter what color I glaze in, uh, it matches the clay. With the gray clay, that was sort of the same thing, but less people actually like that clay. <laughs> um, and the red clay I like personally, but it's a little more tricky because some colors doesn't work with the red clay. Anyway, that's just what I found out. So I will be focusing in this video on uh, plates made with the black clay. 
But because <laughs> this is sort of like an edited video, I took some pieces from different videos I did in the past with the tools and the plates and the glazing. You will occasionally in this video see me talking about something using a plate in a different color than black. Don't be confused about that. It's just because this video is sort of like a summary mix of the different uh, aspects of making plates. So let's throw some plates. Just like when I'm making any other kind of pot, I start out by centering the clay. I cone it up and uh, down a few times usually to align the particles and to get rid of any air bubbles that might be. But then I do something different when I make the plates because usually you would then open up the clay bowl, but instead I push it down into a sort of a puck shape. I don't make it too flat, just flat enough for me to extend it with the PVC tube. And this is a trick that I got from other potters, but actually a really cool way to make it completely smooth and flat. And I compress it at the same time. I make it a little bit bigger than what I need because I'm going to cut off the flange, cut off the edge of it. Because that's how I make them exactly the same size. And for that, I use this new tool. It makes it super easy to cut off at exactly the same size. I usually throw the plates about one centimeter bigger than uh, what I need. Enough to cut off a nice clean cut, but not too much. Then I clean the edge and get ready to add the texture. You don't need to add that texture, but I like it. I think it looks good on my plates. You have to turn the wheel really slowly when you do that, and it can be a little bit tricky to align the two ends perfectly. Then it's time to raise the flange, to make the flange of the plate. And this is where I use my little rip, special rip tool. I push it under the side. Sometimes you get a little bit of clay scraped off, but that's okay. Try not to get too much because then you're going to thin it out. And uh, then slowly move it in under. Sometimes you need to add a little bit of water there to uh, make it smooth enough. But try not to add too much water because that's just going to smudge everything too much. Now it's just time to, um, to finish the edge and make it smooth and nice. But of course you can't touch the area where you had the texture. But um, it depends on whether or not you have texture. And finally, I'm going to add this uh, spiral uh, texture in the middle that I like on my plates. It took a little bit of time to get used to how much you need to pressure to get some texture, <laughs> but not too much that the plate gets well, too bumpy. Um, but you know, it just takes very little uh, experimentation and then you get it. After I do the texture, I do take a sponge and just knock down the, the texture a little bit so, so it doesn't become too strong because that's going to distort the, the way of using the plate. So um, I like it just to be a little bit subtle. And that's it. As you may have noticed, I don't wire off my plates. And why is that? Because most often you would see putters wire off um, the plates. I don't do it for two reasons. The main reason is that if you're using wooden bats or you're using a casting bats, um, they uh, release themselves because uh, it soaks some of the water out of it and then in a couple of days it releases itself. And uh, therefore I don't need to cut it off. And also, when you cut it off with a wire like this, the problem is that when you have such a white button, it tends to go up a little bit like that, not so much, but something like this. And that can lead to areas where it actually almost cut through. You've probably seen that with some uh, products as well. So for those two reasons, I don't do it. It's also much faster. Now the plates have dried for almost 24 hours, maybe closer to 20. And it is warm now. It is summer, as I said. I dressed up a little bit more today, but it is warm. And so they do dry quickly, which is a quick reminder because I'm doing 
almost everything the wrong way. I'm doing things differently than what most partners would tell you to do. So I don't cut off, I don't wire off the plates, and I don't cover them when I'm dry. So I leave them uncut and I dry them super fast. And still, out of the first 25 or so plates that I did, not one single one of them cracked and not one single one of them warped. They all came out technically perfect. So maybe I'm just lucky. Maybe it's a combination of the clay and the room I'm drying in. I can't be sure, but it works for me. So in case you are thinking about doing plates, don't worry too much. Don't listen too much <laughs> to what your teachers and more experienced partners say. Just try it out. If it works for you, it's great. Not cutting them off, it is important that it sucks out some of the water from the plates and um, that I can take it off. So let's just see. Yeah, they're just getting off. Perfect. Now, if you look at this button, this is one of the main reasons I like not to cut them off. It's just super smooth and plain. So now I want to do some trimming and I really just need to trim the corner a little bit and then I'll just um, I will, will, uh, burnish uh, the button with a shiny stone. I'll show you in a second. But this one definitely turned out great. When you want to trim a plate like this, when you turn it around, the problem is that you have this wide uh, free floating area. And when you trim on that, you very easily push it down. And when you do that, of course, you get the plate out of shape and we get that internal shape we don't want. So in the past, what I've done is I put some bubble plast or something underneath it to, to kind of support it. But then I'm left with another problem. And that is for this design, with the flanges that are being this uh, small, I want to trim it all the way down. So what you would usually do is when you put it on your wheel head, you would put some lumps of clay to keep it in place. But that's not going to work so well with these plates. Also, they're so big that they're actually touching the, <laughs> the pins that I have on my, um, my wheel head. So they don't fit. And of course, I could put a bed on, but it won't really glue onto the bed. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a specialized foam chuck, you could say. <laughs> so I'm going to glue some of this. I already cut them, but I'll get back to you on that, uh, onto a bed. And that way I can put it underneath it and it will, I will of course make it round. So it'll support the plate completely um, where it's most sensitive. And it will be very easy to adjust it. And because the foam has this friction to it, it will actually hold the plate in place. The first cut here doesn't have to be very precise because we're not actually uh, using the full size. I'm just cutting out some of it to be able to fit it to my um, bed and uh, put it on my wheel head. I'll just use a scissor. This is a very easy material to work with. So, now we have a, a better fit. To glue something like this, this material, this foam, uh, you need a glue that is strong enough to hold it, that's not too bad because you're, you're applying a downward pressure, so it doesn't really fly that much around. But you need to be careful because uh, some glue will actually eat the foam, <laughs> so it drips through. And so you need a, uh, a glue that is uh, especially made for, for, for foam. You can probably get that in your builder's market. I already have one that, um, that I used to put up these uh, insulation uh, panels in my recording studio. So um, I'm going to put some of that on. Ah, yeah, it's, it's running out. <laughs> oh, there we go. I actually got a little bit too much on it, so I'm just going to distribute it like this and then turn it around and put it here. Yeah, that actually sits quite well. So now we have the middle. And now it will probably be best to let it dry a little bit, but we can try it with this um, already um, thrown uh, and, and, and fired uh, plate. And yeah, I think
English was great. Great. So that's my foam chalk for um, for plates. I'm just gonna let this dry a little bit, and then I'll get back to you um, with the plates. Now, of course, these plates are a little bit bigger, but I think that will still work. Or maybe in the end, I will have to uh, make another one. See. Already now, you can see some advantages because you can keep your fingers under it. That means you don't dump it on your bed and sometimes you uh, crack the, the sides of it. And it's easy to move around. I'm gonna do very little trimming on these plates. I'm just gonna round off the corner and then I will burnish uh, the whole plate. I'm also gonna go down the side a little bit because sometimes when you use this, um, my rip tool um, um, can leave a little bit of crumbles and I want to make sure that there's none of that. I'm very happy with how they turned out. I mean, first of all, <laughs> they all survived. And uh, some people are very afraid of how to, um, to fire the plates because they think they're very fragile. And I don't know, maybe they are to some, but these clays are very um, solid. They work really well. I even stacked, um, I think up to six or seven of the, of the plates on top of each other <clears throat> and none of them cracked. They all have nice bottoms. Um, and one of the things that I'm really happy about is the time that I spent, not that much actually, but I, uh, as you may remember, I burnished um, the button, uh, first with a soft rib and then with a shiny stone. Um, <clears throat> and because of the, the foamy uh, bed that I made for my plates, it was quite easy. I could apply the right pressure. And now they feel like, well, <laughs> Baby skin, <laughs> we try to say, they usually say in Denmark. Maybe a little bit awkward, but you know what I mean. It's just super smooth and nice. And that's good because I'm not gonna have glaze on, um, on the outside of the rim and the bottom, of course. I'm just gonna do glazing on the inside. There are many ways that you can uh, glaze plates. Probably unlimited ways you can glaze them. I tried different uh, versions. I, <clears throat> in the first ones I did, I, um, I waxed the button um, and then I dipped it. I hold them like this and I dipped them into my bucket. That was okay, but two things, it was quite time consuming and I still had to wash it off uh, because even though it's easy to wash off with the wax, I still had to do that work. Then I tried um, using a, a a, a, a some type of tube um, could be syringe <coughs> actually sorry um, and I put it on the wheel and I used that and a brush and it was okay I mean it's just not all glazes that will work for that um, so today I'm gonna do what I think is actually the, the easiest and best ways for the glazes I'm using where I'm actually just gonna pour a little bit of glaze into it swirl it around and take it out for most of the of the rim, it's going to be fine. Of course, where I pull it out, it's going to be a little bit of overflow. That's easy to remove. And then I will take a sponge all the way around and make sure that it looks really nice. Glaze on the inside, raw clay on the outside. so bad. Yeah, this looks very nice and even. Um, so I'm optimistic. As always, it's sort of a puzzle to figure out how to stack the kiln the best way. And as I mentioned, I have these wonderful uh, plate shelves. 
that I can use to uh, to stack plates. And I think this way I can actually have two um, stacks in each layer. And I think I can have maybe four or five um, in each. So that means 10 plates in each layer. That's very good. And as you see, there's still some space around it. So I can place some, um, some vases. I have some stuff I can put there. And uh, depending on what I will put next to it, I can, I can then decide how high I'm going to stack this. That's going to be very efficient. I'm only going to stack, <clears throat> I found out, four plates times two in this layer. And that's because the vase I have over here is not higher than this. So it doesn't make any sense to make it any higher. I can see now that it would make good sense to have some cups to fill up um, the spaces around these uh, plates. Unfortunately, I don't have any cups that uh, needs to get um, fired, or some tall vases, slim vases. But still, you know, I have eight plates in just one layer, and I can probably have two or three layers more. So I'm hoping I can have all 25 plates. Let's see. Now I'm done. I glazed all my plates and uh, a few extra things, uh, some bowls and some vases. So um, now I'm going to start the fire and um, in about two days it should be ready, one and a half day maybe. I will of course show you the results. Good morning. It's Sunday morning, had my first cup of coffee. It's a little bit cold. It is early springtime in Denmark, so that's how it is. Now the kiln have cooled down. It's uh, below 100 degrees, uh, so it's ready. Oh. And I know I said this many times before, but please wait. I'm not personally the most patient person, but um, it pays off to wait. First of all, if you open it too early, especially with the glaze fire, you could crackle up the glaze and destroy your pots. Um, but also the heating elements. You put stress on your heating elements if you open the kiln too early and then they won't last as long and they're very expensive to, um, to change. But also, I mean, what's the point in opening it when it's super hot? Because you can't touch the pots anyway and you can't put them anywhere. So in my case, it's usually about one and a half days or 36 hours and then um, it's below 100 degrees when I can open it. So um, let's go and take a look. It's so exciting. Ah, that looks really good. Even though it's um, below 100 degrees, it's still pretty warm. <laughs> um, I wouldn't like to touch them with my bare hands, but uh, it looks very good so far. Now the plates are done. They've been bisque fired and I glazed them and I hate to brag, but I am so happy. <laughs> I finally got to the plate that I want, at least the dinner plate size. Evaluating a function wear or kitchen wear like this, there are really two sides of it. One is the visual part of it, because I want it to be beautiful. You know, otherwise I could just buy some cheap shit in Ikea. But I want this to stand out and be beautiful. So from an aesthetic point of view, that's one thing. And of course, that's very subjective. But there's also a functional part of it, which is a tricky part <laughs> with, with functional wear and kitchen wear and dinner plates like this. But they came out technically perfect in my mind. First of all, they stack really well. This is 11 plates and it only takes up, what is it, like 15 centimeter? So they take up very little space in my um, cabinets. That's one thing. The other thing is that they um, fit very well into my dishwasher. That was another problem I had with big plates because of a big, big flange. They become so big that they don't fit my, kit, uh, my um, dishwasher. These ones do. And the most tricky part is probably to glaze it in a way that they don't leave cutlery marks. And this is tricky because you probably had some kitchenware like cups or plates, something. And then when you use uh, uh, cutlery, metal cutlery, 
they over time leave marks and it kind of just makes them look a bit dirty. It doesn't look so good. But what is it <laughs> that makes a glaze uh, responsive to, to, um, to cutlery? It's a little bit tricky. It's basically a question of the glaze being too hot. <laughs> Not that a glaze can get too hot, but for a plate or cup, it can. Um, sometimes it's because there's a lot of circle packs in it. Uh, it can be other materials that makes it hard. But the good thing is, with these plates, I now use them uh, a few times. Also, these glazes I, I used in the first batch of my plates, and, um, and I use them every day for like a couple of months, and there's no marks. Also, I wash them in the washing machine for, I don't know, 20, 30 times, and they come out perfect. So that was all the technical part of it, and I really love how that came out. Now to the more aesthetic part of it. I mean, look at this. I just love this plate. The flange came out perfect, uh, so strong, and the, the swirly, and, and I mean, it comes out really strong with this glaze. This is a, a sort of a yellow glaze, but on the dark uh, black uh, clay, it comes out more like a, uh, orange ochre type of uh, glaze. And this is the other one that I tested and that everybody seemed to like. Um, a green one. This is the one that was supposed to be gray. <laughs> Remember, I added a um, little bit of black stain and very, very little bit of cobalt. But I forgot that there's a lot of titanium in the rutile and titanium and cobalt creates green. I didn't know that. Now I know. So it was a mistake, but I love it. <laughs> it's just a beautiful glaze. So I'm going to continue at least with these two colors on my plate. Then I tried to make the gray one. <laughs> uh, I made it uh, with a, a black stain uh, that um, was originally used by another potter to create this gray. Um, and I mean, it's still beautiful, but it's not. I mean, it's difficult to see on video. It's not completely gray. It's got a little bit of a yellow, greenish tint to it. Um, so I'm probably not going to continue with this because it's too close to uh, this one. But it's definitely beautiful. I used it also on a, on a couple of uh, these cups and I used it on a, a pitcher. And uh, I think it comes out, it, it looks like some old stoneware. Um, and, and so the glaze is definitely good. I'm definitely going to keep it. I just don't think this is going to be the third color I'm going to use for my plates. Anyway, that was a whole lot of talking. <laughs> I'm just so excited for my plates. Anyway, I hope you like this video and uh, please subscribe if you like it. Uh, write a comment, share, whatever you like. And um, I will have a new video coming up next Sunday, usually at 5 uh, p.m. Central European time. So. Um, I just hope to see you there and uh, enjoy the summer. <laughs>